from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you very much. We, I think, had a very, very informative uh, first half of the day where we talked about um, how the current exclusive rights in Title 17 um, do cover a making available right in our law. Um, but we also had a, a number of comments that acknowledged that courts have struggled um, to really understand the contours of such a right. And so now on this panel, we really want to focus um, to some practical issues with respect to um, how US courts have considered the making available right and w whether it would be of some benefit to the courts, to parties and litigants and others to have further clarification in our law in terms of how the United States does implement um, a making available right. So I'm going to, just as we did in the other panels, I'm going to start with just asking everyone to identify themselves, and then we'll start off with some questions. I'll start first with Alan. Alan Adler. I'm general counsel and vice president for government affairs for the Association of American Publishers. Sandra Astars, CEO of the Copyright Alliance. Uh, Jonathan Ban, Library Copyright Alliance. Hi, I'm Gregory Barnes. I'm general counsel, Digital Media Association. Bider, John Bider, still with the law firm of uh, uh, Shackelford, Zumwalt, and Hayes, still representing CSAC. Andrew Bridges, I'm an internet and copyright litigator in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. The general. Oh, there it goes, there it goes, okay. Keith Kuberschmidt, general counsel and senior vice president for intellectual property for the Software and Information Industry Association. Patrice Lyons, General Counsel, Corporation for National Research Initiatives. Peter Manel, University of California at Berkeley School of Law. Laura Moy, Public Knowledge. Uh, Nancy Wolf with uh, PACA, the Digital Media Licensing Association, uh, association that's involved in licensing uh, images primarily. Great, thank you very much. I think we're going to start off first with a, just a very broad question that we'll see if um, uh, panelists want to respond, and then we'll drill down into some specific issues. So in terms of the, the initial broad question uh, for all the panelists, I just wanted to ask, um, again, we had some discussion earlier today about courts struggling to actually assess um, how we have, or whether we have a making available right in our law. Uh, for example, what type of uh, actual evidence is necessary to prove an actual to prove a distribution under our law. So the broad question I have first is whether there would be any benefit to parties, to litigants, uh, to users even, for from further clarification, um, either through legislative amendment or through a copyright office report in this area. S Sandra, I guess I, I would s start by saying that. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we might have um, legislation or a statute uh, that would be drafted a bit more clearly. Um, but given the circumstances um, in which we find ourselves, it's probably um, not realistic to uh, redraft the statute as it currently exists. Um, however, I do think it would be helpful to have further guidance from the Copyright Office um, perhaps setting out um, more specifically um, the evidentiary uh, requirements, the um, specific um, attributes of the various rights involved in Section 106 and how the making available uh, right is implemented through those. Thank you. Do I have anyone else? John Bider. Um, thank you. Um, the comments at CSAC, um, uh, submitted uh, were uh, joint comments with ASCAP, BMI, the Nash, uh, Music Publishers, and the Songwriters Guild of America. I'm speaking for CSAC, but the comments are joint. Uh, these organizations believe that 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 the making available right is is 
already implicit in the enumerated rights in 106, but uh, believe that some clarification uh, might be in order. And when you say clarification, do you have a distinction between clarification through a legislative change or clarification? Uh, by yeah, yes, legislatively. Uh, we don't think it would be an expansion of rights because we believe those rights are already uh, already there. Uh, possibly including, you know, a phrase uh, specifically invoking making available uh, in the list of uh, exclusive rights. Uh, I think next is Ms. Wolf and then uh, Professor Bedell. Um, I think when you look at the display right and um, the way courts have interpreted on the internet, there may be a time soon where there may need some clarification. Um, because if the display right for visual art is really the only right they have online, and if the display right can be circumvented um, by technology, so in effect, any you know website user can have the benefit of a you know full visual display, but by clever framing, um, never have to license and circumvent license um, because it doesn't reside on their server. And if the courts continue to require um, that a copy be made on the server of the um, website that is taking advantage of the you know the benefit of the visual display it could eventually eviscerate completely any kind of licensing or any display right for visual artists. So I think if this broadening of, um, maybe broadening is the wrong word, but if technology is continued to be developed so that uh, there are ways of framing or you know, um, displaying images and there's never you know, an infringer down the road that you could ever um, obtain any kind of judgment against, you could put all the images in some foreign or star country, we'll really have a problem if there's no more licensing model for visual images. And I think that's, you know, with technology advancing, something that there's a lot of concerns within the industry. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Manel? In light of the conversation this morning, I think that there was nearly uh, unanimous agreement. I won't say unanimous, there's at least one a uh, member of this panel who I think disagrees, but I think the idea that you could establish a violation of 106 by uh, showing that someone has taken a, a copyrighted work and putting it into a folder or some internet accessible uh, uh, location from which the work can be accessed by the public, which gets into a whole bunch of other issues, but those are, uh, I think, uh, being worked out in other venues right now, that having that clearly established would greatly simplify litigation that's going on in many different parts of the system. Uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, it would clarify uh, the joinder issues. Uh, it would, I think, dramatically reduce some of the discovery costs. There are a whole bunch of sort of aspects of what we're talking about today that reverberate through the entire litigation system. That said, I certainly think that it would be unwise for Congress to, to do this without also taking on issues such as remedies. Uh, I think on the panel this morning we heard from the Library of Congress that, that you know, to expose libraries to potentially wide-ranging liability because of repositories that they have uh, you know, if we were going to uh, discourage preservation of materials, those are all things that I think would be unfortunate, unwise, and time sensitive. The longer we wait to clarify these rights, the, the, the less preservation there will be. And so I would try to identify all of the issues that are reasonably closely related. Uh, and I'll also add that once you're opening up remedies, that also opens up 512, it opens up orphan works. There are a lot of different parts of the system. So I don't think we can easily cabin this issue. Uh, and I, as a scholar, wouldn't want to see that. I would like to see a much broader engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mann? I, you know, the, the hip bone is connected to the thigh bone and so, and, and, and so forth. And so, uh, so certainly on one level you can say yes, you know, Clarification is always a good thing because there's always some ambiguity and uncertainty. But uh, to start 
sort of clarifying the nature of this right would require you know, redefining the other rights to make sure you don't have uh, unnecessary overlap and you have to think about the impact on contracts and then you need to, you know, you have to say, well, is it just prospective or retrospective? And, it, and, and then uh, as, you know, statutory damages, I think clearly would be part of the discussion and then exceptions uh, for various cases. So it gets very, very confusing very quickly and you have to say, is, you know, is, is the situation so bad that it's worth you know, you know, kind of uh, to use another overused metaphor. You know, just like uh, picking, uh, 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 you know, one, one at, at one thread in a in a knitted sweater, and then the whole thing has to will fall apart. So I, I think, as a practical matter, here I agree with Sandra. You know, you know, maybe there's uh, some ambiguity, but we're probably better off letting the courts deal with uh, the cases as they arise, as opposed to trying to deal with it legislatively because the only way to deal with it would be to, to really deal with all the moving pieces at the same time. Um, and, and I think to the extent, you know, the, the option then, if we're not doing legislative amendment, then we're saying, oh, clarification in, in the Copyright Office. But I think to some extent it's the same problem, meaning, you know, the, the, the Copyright Office needs to be very cognizant that sort of you know, <coughs> squeezing over here, again, to use another metaphor, it's like squeezing this part of the balloon will cause something else to move somewhere else. And so uh, you have to be very careful um, to start saying, okay, well, we think this, you know, then you have to sort of think of all the possible ramifications, and, and they're not, not only the ones we've already talked about here, but as I said, you know, what about the impact on first sale? And, and, and you know, I, I, I would, I agree with, Professor Ginsburg, that there is an argument as to why this would not, you could, you could interpret it, uh, this in one way so that it would not have a, uh, an implication for first sale, but I think that that's something that would be litigated. I mean, I think that there's a very good argument that, uh, you, know, you know, she has her argument and I think someone would come up with a counter argument based on the statute. And so, uh, I, again, you have to be very, tread very, very carefully in this area. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, Mr. Um, Biter, Nick. Um, okay, um, so I'm going to go with uh, Mr. Bridges, um, Ms. Lyons, uh, Mr. Cooper Schmidt. Thank you. I think that uh, courts do a good job of working kinks out over time. Maybe it takes longer than some people would like, but I do think that law tends to get clarified over time the more courts work with things. Uh, I need to confess to some real cynicism in copyright policy making when I hear the words clarification, harmonization, and rationalization. Because I have never encountered in my recent memory any occasion where those drove at any object other than expanding the powers and rights of copyright owners. So, and I've heard one instance today when the display right, what I, what I heard from uh, my friend Nancy uh, involved a case that I litigated and won, Perfect 10 versus Amazon.com. And what I'm hearing from her on the clarification is actually she wants a different outcome. I don't consider that to be clarification, I consider that to be a change. Uh, I am concerned as to what stakeholders the Copyright Office has closest at heart. And uh, and to what extent the professionals who tend to, to congregate, uh, you know, in the, in the, inside the beltway would be driving that process when I do think that copyright law is for the nation and for the entire nation. And that is its first beneficiary. And so uh, the, the enthusiasm that I perceive here among certain par persons for the Copyright Office to make a statement is one that, frankly, I, I don't share. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, not make a, a, a comment. Other than that, we cl hold you all very close to our hearts. Um, and that is why we seek public comments from everyone and anyone who actually um, wants to submit them to and, our office. And, and I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Cooper Schmidt and then Ms. Lyons and then Mr. Glazier. All right, thank you. Um, as I mentioned in the earlier panel I was on, uh, we do not think that any type of uh, further clarification or amendment to the statute is necessary 
if you look at the cases, the v overwhelming vast majority of the cases um, using the sort of two filters I put in place earlier, I can repeat them if people want me to, um, put it using those filters, I think that the vast majority of cases prove that there is this making available right uh, under U.S. copyright. So if you're asking me, do I think it's necessary uh, for some kind of a, amendment or, for, or clarification, the answer is absolutely not. Um, certainly not in the legislation area. If you're asking, would there be a benefit uh, to clarification? Uh, sure, why not? I mean, it, just to, just to you know, further clarify things, but certainly not legislatively. I mean, it would have to be some type of statement. Uh, there's also the, the, the possibility that this danger comes with a clarification. What we think is a clarification actually sort of further uh, confuses the issue. Um, and therefore, if, if you're asking, would I prefer that the such clarification, if it comes, come from Congress or the Copyright Office? I choose the Copyright Office just for that purpose. Um, and, but the, you ultimately, you have to ask, where do we stop? I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different areas in copyright law that could stand to be clarified. Um, and so why are we just picking on this particular area? Um, and then lastly, I just want to address the, the, the Hotling case that Professor Manel referred to and the, and the gentleman this morning also mentioned about, you know, worry about potential chilling effects uh, on libraries. I mean, that case is 17 years old, so if there's some chilling effect, let's, let's see what it is and let's see if there's something that need, needs to be addressed. There ought to be sufficient evidence if there is some type of chilling effect by this point. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lyons. I think what's next? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, this is very good, your holiness, right now, to see, take the temperature of the room, see what they think. Uh, going back historically, uh, it's sort of a generational thing that you revise the copyright statute. And sometimes war would intervene historically, and so it had put it off for 10 years or more. But on cycles of 20 years, usually, now we're well beyond that, uh, technology changed dramatically. Like when broadcasting came in, it was necessary to reevaluate the law. Um, there are many provisions of the law that could be impacted on the concept of copy, for example. Um, if, if that's kind of made something other than what it was, I think, really intended to be, then, then that could ripple to many things. For sale doctrine, they had the Section 104 proceeding a few years ago. If the making available right, on the other hand, is going to fall on the communication to the public, the public performance right, then you're going to get into, are we going to slap compulsory licenses on the whole thing, when maybe you're really talking about performing computer programs and you, you just don't know that this is the new kind of expression that you're dealing with. So my suggestion would be that maybe it's way overdue that they have studies. You know, and copyright office used to do this in the past. They'd have studies, and Congress would mandate that they do this, not just for particular issues. We still do. But more generally. OK? No, I, I'll get to my point. Uh, more generally, so that you could actually look at the interrelationship between the different pieces. Otherwise, you're just going to poke your finger in this, and it will have ripple effects that may be unintended. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to go to Mr. Glazier, uh, Ms. Wolf, Mr. Barnes. And Mr. Beter. Thank you. Um, until it gets to a point where the courts start interpreting the law in a manner different than Congress intended, there's no reason for Congress to amend the law. I don't think we're to the point yet where courts have interpreted the distribution right or the performance right in a manner that is you know so different than what Congress intended in trying to make sure that we were complying with the WIPO treaties when this was being debated in 1996 that we are yet to the point where Congress needs to go in and amend to correct the courts who have now veered away from the original intention the intention was the intention was made pretty clear it's not like this question wasn't debated and debated very extensively during the treaty negotiations, by the PTO and the NII report, by the committee during the hearing process and the drafting process for the implementation legislation. And the consensus was that for the broader rights in 106, we were in compliance, making available was covered, uh, and that within the patchwork of distribution, reproduction, and performance, there was no need to re-skew or otherwise affect standing meetings at the time, but 
when Congress revisited specific situations where electronic theft was the subject and they wanted to address whether or not distribution, for example, covered making available, they were quite specific. So in the NET Act, when Congress was looking at the response to the LaMakia case, where a, I think we called them bulletin boards, uh, which was described in Section 506 as making available on a computer network to members of the public or accessible to members of the public, they basically described the making available right in the context of Section 506 and the criminal copyright law, specifically adapting making available to that particular context and showing what their intention was. And the copyright register at the time was pretty clear about what she thought the intentions were. So I think the idea of relating this to other uh, elements in the copyright law like first sale are political markers um, which are part of the legislative process that might indicate if Congress was ever going to do this we want to make sure this is put on the table as a trade-off. I don't think they're actually related to the subject that Congress identified that the Copyright Office identified. So I do think it's a great idea for the Copyright Office to reiterate after these court cases um, what it believes the law is and what Congress intended. I think the Copyright Office is the guardian of the national interest when it comes to copyright law and policy, uh, and that uh, the Copyright Office does that job pretty well. And if for some reason, beyond the guidance that's already been given by the Copyright Office in the past, and I hope after this process, uh, the courts still veer away in a direction that was unintended by Congress, perhaps Chairman Goodlatte, who was the author of the NET Act, where they very clearly spelled out what making available meant vis-a-vis -a, -vis a computer network and accessibility to members of the public, will once again clarify it if he has to, but I don't think we're there yet. Thank you very much. I think we had uh, Ms. Wolf and then Mr. Barnes and then Mr. Beter. Go back to the display right. Um, and I'm not sure now today that uh, a visual artist has much of a display right when you look at the, the type of framing that's involved that has advanced much further than even it was in the Perfect 10 versus Amazon case. At that time, you got a small thumbnail. When you clicked on it, you went directly to the website where the image was located, and the web website was grayed out. Now, um, with the, the current way image searches, when you click on the thumbnail, you don't get any reference to the website. You just get a, a high-res uh, visual of the image. And for many people, that's all you need. Um, and that's the display right. Uh, that's what gets licensed, and that's the, the enhancement of that web page is that visual image. So I think things have changed even since the Perfect 10 versus Amazon case, and not every court has agreed that that's the right way to look at it. You have the uh, Flavor Works uh, and Gunter case in Illinois. Um, so I, I think that sort of the per se linking the reproduction with the display is where um, is something that is not in the act and the courts have tied them together. And I think that maybe could possibly be clarified by even the Copyright Office in looking at each one of these six rights are distinct and you can have a violation of one without a violation of the other. Thank you very much. Um, I think we had um, Mr. Barnes and then Mr. Reeder. Uh, yeah, um, I'm a little confused now because I agree with most of what Mitch has said. Uh, which is uh, atypical. Um, what I'll say though is I, I think the way the question was uh, initially posited, court struggling, I guess the way it was framed, I don't know if courts have struggled that much. Um, I think if you look at what most of the comments you guys have received on this topic thus far indicate is, I mean, most people feel like they've got it right thus far and they've been able to deal with the situation and it's allowed for the flexibility um, that most U.S. authorities have acknowledged in, in the bundle of rights. And so I don't know if at this point we need a clarification via the Copyright Office and or through legislation. Uh, what I really hear as kind of this underlying theme is, you know, we want you guys to stand ready in case we lose certain decisions and we're not happy with the outcome. And I don't know if that's the right way to approach this, this problem. What I will say, though, is if there is going to be clarification, I think it has to come through the legislative system, and it can't come through just some type of um, advisory opinion 
um, offered by the Copyright Office because, uh, as Jonathan pointed out, I mean, there are a lot of related components that attach to this um, that will be affected, and it, statutory damage is just being one that's been discussed. I mean, the Copyright Office at, on, on those topics can only discuss recommendations. They can't make changes in law, and they can't advise uh, the courts necessarily to apply statutory damages in a different fashion. So I think it's very dangerous for the Copyright Office to kind of go in that direction. I think if it's going to be handled, it would have to be handled by the legislative system, which then could look at several different components. Thank you very much. I think we had Mr. Beter and then Ms. Astars. I promised Jay Rosenthal that I'd say this, but we, when the topic came up a while back about who are the, uh, who are the stakeholders uh, most near and dear to the hearts of people in this room, I, I would really be remiss if I didn't say that our organizations represent songwriters, and I'm thinking about the guy who's sitting in Nashville right now writing a song and struggling with the second verse. Those are the stakeholders. I'm going to use the word author because that's what they are, and um, any gathering like this that doesn't note that is, uh, you know, has, well, we always should. Secondly, we also believe that the Copyright Office, it would be very helpful if the Copyright Office would provide some guidance concerning the existence of, of the making available right within the exclusive rights under 106. And thirdly, again, we are not thinking in terms of expanding rights. If it becomes necessary to take a legislative route, we believe that uh, a, a clarification of what we believe is already exist, uh, existing could be easily accomplished with um, um, you know, some language in 106. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Astars. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment on uh, what uh, my colleague, Mr. Barnes, uh, said. Uh, two things. One, uh, we actually did say quite clearly in our comments that we do want uh, both the Copyright Office and Congress to stand ready in case the courts do um, rule in certain cases, in particular um, with regard to the public performance right, uh, in ways that uh, put us in um, a situation where we no longer comply with our treaty obligations and where we no longer have an effective public performance right. Um, and so th that is um, indeed uh, our position uh, on the issues. Uh, I don't think that that's anything to uh, be ashamed about or to, to try and hide. Um, secondly, as far as why I think this isn't uh, necessarily the time for legislation and why I would prefer uh, the first step to be guidance coming from the Copyright Office, um, and uh, Jonathan Band alluded to this in his comments as well. Um, the one area of flexibility I think that um, clarification from the Copyright Office affords us is that um, what you do does not necessarily uh, change how uh, issues are dealt with in contract law between parties, existing uh, contracts between parties, and my worry is that if we start changing definitions um, without an adequate understanding of existing contractual relationships um, that have grown up over many, many decades, um, that we uh, actually disrupt a licensing system that is you know, working fairly well um, and you know, put ourselves in a situation where um, it, it becomes even more challenging to uh, effectively license rights. Thank you. Mr. Beter? Oh, you didn't have anything. Um, as a, a follow-up question, and I'll, I'll pose a hypothetical, um, would any of your views change with respect to need to potential clarification if uh, the Supreme Court were to rule in the Aereo case in a position contrary to the brief uh, filed by the United States government? Uh, my position would not change. That was what I was referring to. Um, uh, Even after the Aereo case, yes. Yeah, I think she was saying no, that her no, no, position no. was so that. My, my position was if the courts rule incorrectly in uh, cases dealing <laughs> with the public performance right, namely Aereo, <laughs> we may very well be seeking legislation to, uh, to address that issue. So. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we're putting all the pieces of your view together. Others? Ms. Lyons. 
Yes, I'll reiterate because I think it would be even more urgent to start the process now because basically, in my view, some of the basic technical issues weren't briefed to the court. So the court judges on what it's presented. And if the whole notion of transcoding or the making of the derivative work in this context, it's uninformed as to what may be actually happening. And so um, the patent law may play a big role in this, and yet that that could dominate copyright in ways, and, and it already is, as a matter of fact, over the last couple of years, maybe the last 20 years, there's an imbalance, really, between copyright and patent. And when you get into the performance right, for example, performing a patented method, and you represent that with a patented data structure, well, you see, that used to be called you know, uh, expression of a work, and used to have public domain ways of doing that. And so a novel, for example, is a public domain way of structuring a literary work. And if it's fixed on paper, people can actually write novels in that form. But when you get into managing information in the internet environment, the data structures themselves, although we have a, a data structure we've made out available in the public domain, there are many different highly patented ways of doing that. So to what extent the basic rights under copyright are being severely restricted without actually examining the technical background. So I, I reiterate, I think this is a timely point which to fundamentally rethink what we're doing. Thank you very much. I'm gonna to go to Mr. Band and then Mr. Uh, Glazier. Sure, so in response to uh, Maria's hypothetical, I think a lot would depend on you know, exactly what the reasoning of the court was. Uh, if in the highly unlikely event that they issued a ruling that was sort of so sweeping that it really would encompass cloud computing, uh, uh, then, then yes, you know, then I would think that we would want uh, statutory change. But if they were to adopt uh, something more narrow, something along the lines of what the SG was recommending, then, you know, I don't think that, uh, you know, even though, you know, I may or may not agree with all the reasoning of the court, I would think that at that point it would be probably not necessary to, um, uh, uh, you know, for Congress to get involved. I mean, I think, I think it, it's, again, it's always a bit of a, you know, th there's, there's this notion that, well, when Congress gets involved and they clarify things that you really have clarity, and I think, you know, you, you only get a little bit of clarity. Uh, I think there's always going to be new fact patterns, new situations, and again, area is a perfect example where, you know, building on, on what, what Patrice was saying, you know, one of the problems was, you know, because of the strange way cable vision was litigated and the issues that were never resolved in cable vision because of the stipulation, that led this you know, area to be litigated in a very strange way. And, and so you, you don't have an area, you know, the courts, none of the courts looked at the most basic issue, which was who was doing this, right? The whole issue of who was the volitional actor. There is no decision on that. You know, so in many ways, the, the, what the Supreme Court really should do is remand and say, okay, figure out who is the volitional actor, but that, that's probably not gonna happen. But the point is, is that you know, it, it doesn't matter what the statute says, given that in that case, it's not clear, and you know, all the briefs are sort of talking past each other because there's no ruling as to who is the volitional actor. And obviously, if 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 ultimately the you know if Aria is the volitional actor, they lose. If the users are the volitional actor, I think Aria wins. Uh, and and a lot of the you know, who cares what the transmit clause says? Um, so, but I think that that's the point: is that you know, you could. You might not like the result. You go to Congress. You come up, come up with some kind of clarification, but then. There's going to be the next case, new fact pattern, and uh, uh, you know we're not necessarily going to be any better off than we were with the existing statutory framework. Thank you. I'm going to go to Mr. Uh, Glazier and then Professor Manel. Thank you. I think the question in Aereo, if Congress had to amend the law, might focus a little bit more precisely on what to the public means than it does on making available or distribution or performance or right of communication. You know, it, in that case, I don't think that the concept of making available is as much at stake as are you making it available to the public? And right now, whether it's the distribution right or the performance right or transmission in 106.6, to the public is the key piece there. And even where Congress clarified 
the distribution right in the NET Act for purposes of Section 506, it was to make available on a computer network accessible to the public. So I, I think if Congress were to open up the Copyright Act because of Aereo in order to address the issue in Aereo in the government's brief, it would have to focus on whether or not what Aereo did was actually a one-to-many public act, even though they tried to get around it by using, you know, 1950s technology in 2014, you know, sort of cloud computing case. If the question is, while the patient is on the table, are there opportunities to address other acts within the copyright law, whether it is for politics and trade-off, which I think are some of the things that um, Jonathan has put on the table, or things that might need to be clarified, like Professor Minnell has put on the table. I think that's a little bit of a related but separate question. But I'm not sure that Aereo itself, uh, it might be the catalyst, but I'm not sure that it itself raises the making available question, nor should it be interpreted by anybody that a result in Aereo somehow means we don't have a making available right. Thank you. Professor Minnell. I tend to agree with uh, Register Palante's call for a much broader review of the entire copyright statute. And I realize that we're here for a more limited purpose, but I feel that this is going to take some time. And we have, I think, good reason. Uh, I, I think we're well past the period at which the 76 Act is obsolete on so many dimensions. We've We've come up with a whole bunch of kludgy solutions. We're relying on courts to come up with other kludges. And uh, while this is happening, we're losing a lot of the public. And, and I say that because this is not the crowd where that broader public is present. And Andrew's point about, you know, he's worried that we won't have the right people in the room and that this process is, when you go back to the 1960s, it was a pretty open process. It's true that it didn't include consumer groups and some of their groups because that was less uh, in play. Today it's in play, and I think that we are a country that is democratically governed, and so I worry about the path dependence of waiting for Supreme Court to do things and Congress to react. I think Congress can be proactive. We're long past a point at which Congress uh, should be looking at these issues. Just let me pick a specific example that, that relates very closely. So the last time we looked at damages was in 1999. It was the Digital Deterrence Act, and it was focused on a very particular pathology. It was the pathology of perhaps a bulletin board service that's putting video games up. Uh, the software industry was perhaps united with the recording industry, the motion picture industry, and that was the target. Within a year of that legislation, Napster happened. And Napster completely changed the terms of the debate. And I don't think anyone who was coming up with that regime was thinking about the issues. And so making available followed after that. So, you know, we can say courts, you know, might get this right. Uh, but meanwhile, the world, and I don't mean that in just kind of a, uh, you know, just sort of a, a, a general sense. I mean, I think we have an opportunity to lead on this issue. We ought to lead on this issue. We have the leading industries. And I realize right now there's a lot of uh, nervousness because no one wants to open up the Pandora's box. But uh, Register Palante has already done that. And the Patent Office is starting to do that. And I hope that Congress will see that, that this is not an issue where we want to just wait and react. I think we have a lot of facts, a lot of knowledge. And the process that unfolded 50 years ago could be replicated on a shorter time. It doesn't have to take 20 years. It could happen much sooner, uh, but it would take several years. And this process, I think, is really healthy. And I would love to, to have the discussion. I mean, no one's quite willing to do it yet, but I, I do feel that there are a whole bunch of really valuable improvements that we could make. And it could get perhaps a stronger takedown regime, but much more rational damages. And making available is, is intertwined with that. Thank you. And the only thing I would just um, uh, clarify is just that, yes, um, the, the Copyright Office Register Parlante did mention a review of the entire statute, how that review um, ends up as to whether it, there should be or is a, there is a need for legislative change is something I think um, we have not concluded, and certainly Congress is still considering that as well. Um, did I have anybody else to respond? Oh, um, Mr. Adler. 
I thought it was very interesting that when you asked the question, you didn't pose it in terms of whether or not the Aereo decision came out the wrong way or, or in a way that you would not have supported. You mentioned the United States position. And I think on this issue, the United States government, um, the executive branch, uh, is really vested. For 16 years, they have adhered to the same position that they took originally, uh, which was that the umbrella approach would work in terms of uh, the United States honoring its obligations as a signator to the WIPO treaties. That approach obviously was very attractive at that time because I think there was still a certain resonance from the fact that um, some 20 odd years earlier, we had done the same thing uh, as part of the United States accession to Bern. It accepted the responsibility of moral rights by saying that, well, we already have that embodied in a number of areas uh, of federal law and state law, and they pointed to uh, defamation law, rights of publicity, privacy, and a variety uh, of things like that. Uh, I think what simply happened here is that this turned out to be a tougher issue uh, because so much has changed around the basic premise, uh, unlike what happened with moral rights, where there was relatively little change around the basic premise that said moral rights could be addressed through an umbrella approach. So I think that it's, it's really critical that to the extent that the uh, position on this issue of the executive branch of government, as far as I know, has not changed at all. And in fact, I suppose uh, some would argue that the government has doubled down uh, in terms of carrying its position forward uh, into international trade agreements that it has with respect to uh, the view that at least the United States government for purposes of trade policy believes it knows and understands what the making available right is. I would hope that uh, before we turn this issue over to the kind of you know, food fight environment that would uh, ultimately ensue uh, if Congress were asked to try to deal with this issue among the many other aspects of copyright review that it ultimately may consider uh, as fodder for legislative revision, um, I would think that, that uh, the United States government could do a great service by making sure that in every case where this issue arises, uh, they introduce a brief stating their position with respect to the making available right. Um, if they cannot uh, present their position as to why the umbrella approach is still a valid way of the United States complying with its obligations with respect to this right, uh, then I think we probably have crossed the threshold that might call for congressional action. Uh, but until that happens, I don't think that uh, the actions of less than a handful of uh, lower level federal courts, uh, the actions basically of just a few judges, uh, should ultimately determine that this issue has to be thrown back to Congress and that the executive branch, which advised Congress on the umbrella approach, uh, and the Congress, which accepted that approach and has stood by it all these years, uh, should be suddenly sent back to the drawing board because uh, a few federal judges got the issue wrong. Thank you, Mr. Adler. I think it's Mr. Band next. So, so uh, I, I, might, I might agree with what Alan said, I might not. I'm not sure I 100%. <laughs> but but I, 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 I will say that, that the, the I, I don't think that the the government needs to be intervening in every single case where the making available right comes up. Uh, you know, there's there's many treaty obligations, uh, and arguably, you know, you could say that the U.S. government needs to get involved in all of them by that logic. And I just don't think that that's the case. And I think, again, in this case, you know, I've always thought that the notion that that somehow what what the court does in area has anything to do with the uh, international obligations under uh, concerning the public performance, um, uh, again is is I, I you know is sort of a, is misplaced. Um, uh, how a court rules in any given case it turns on those specific facts, uh, and and you, you know the, the, the treaty obligations go, go much more to s statutes and how statutes in, in what Congress does rather than what happens in any given case. And again, I would like to reiterate, especially in this case, given that uh, if the court were to find that the volitional actor is the user and that there is significance to all of these dime size antennas, then I think that that's fine. And that's, that's the way the court rules. And that hasn't really, you know, it's not a public performance because it's, 
not public, and that th that has nothing to do with uh, what our treaty obligations are because the court has interpreted that there is this intermediary intervening copy uh, that, and that makes a difference. Uh, and there, and I don't think, I don't see why the, any treaty obligation would have an impact on that interpretation, frankly, of the facts. Uh, and so I think that that's, uh, there's this notion always that, oh, you know, this ruling this way or ruling that way will somehow interfere with our international obligations. I think that that's, you know, cases turn on facts and, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the specific facts make a difference. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go on to a, 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 a slightly related question. So I think a number of panelists have mentioned that um, they would not necessarily think that there needed to be legislative change. Um, that clarification might come from Copyright Office guidance, for example. And so one question we had would, would be, um, is there any consensus or agreement as to what that Copyright Office uh, guidance should look like um, in terms of making available? Um, is there a consensus in terms of what um, U.S. law covers in that instance. And so we talked about these, little, these issues a little bit in, in the early old panel, earlier panels, um, but I wanted to kind of go back to some of the specific examples that we weren't able to finish uh, discussing before. So for example, um, in the case of someone who puts uh, a digital file in a share folder, um, would copyright office or would guidance saying that that is in fact a violation of the distribution right to be something that the panel Panel, pan, the panel would agree is appropriate. Um, so I'll just throw it out there and then we can talk about some of those other specific examples that we didn't uh, get a chance to talk about like linking and, and th other things like that. So I wanted to just open it up with a general question and then um, look at specific activities uh, if, we were sp if we were going to provide guidance in this area. I'll start with uh, Mr. Bridges and this, then Ms. Lyons. Thank you. I'll, I'll start with a question on, frankly, on a matter where I think I know a little bit, but I may be ignorant. Has the Copyright Office issued guidance as to whether a purely online website is published? No, I don't believe that we have. I think that's because it touches the very issue here. Because the Copyright Office has issued guidance that says, for a publication to occur, there must have been a distribution of copies to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership, rental, lease, or lending, or an offer to do the same. And so um, if, we're, if we're going to build this discussion around publication, uh, the fact that the Copyright Office uh, on the fundamental building block of the discussion here um, has not taken a position or if the position is there, it is that works that are available only online have not been published, then I don't think we're talking about mere copyright office clarification, but we're talking about an adjustment and possibly a change in copyright office guidance on some issues. This takes us back to the point Ms. Lyons made, which is once we start going into this, there are all sorts of un unintended consequences. And, and then will the copyright office take a position on whether copy in section 109 for the so-called first sale doctrine means the same thing as copy in section 1063. I think once we wanna go down this, uh, uh, my, my view is on, on guidance. Uh, guidance should not be a uh, a vehicle for changing established positions or for putting a system out of equilibrium by focusing on the, the burning issue du jour. Thank you. Ms. Lyons? Thank you. Copyright guidance and statutory interpretation. Um, I remember the regulatory proceedings when I used to be in the Office of General Counsel of Copyright, and then there'd be litigation afterwards. Everybody, how could you have made that decision and that sort of thing? So a careful evaluation, rather than trying to get into statutory guidance, which is somewhat similar to regulatory proceedings, um, might be a more advisable way to consider here, especially when uh, making available may be viewed as a type of public performance. And if you get into that, there is, I mentioned today the patent law, but there's an even bigger morass. It's the communications law. 
And what does it mean to be broadcast and cable and TV? I've been following several uh, proceedings at the FCC where they're trying to grapple with this very issue because when you have information that is structured using the internet protocols and it's made available uh, through what you might call broadcast facilities, you know, just maybe whatever computational facility you might have and take the labels away and look at the functionality, what's actually happening, you may come out with a better way to approach it. Because otherwise, you open the door where people are going to get frustrated. And they're going to say, well, we're going to use it anyhow, and nobody's going to get paid. And you're not going to be going litigating everywhere. I was in a meeting in Europe where a big telco group had invited me as a copyright expert. And actually, somebody from a US university got up in this rather small group and suggest that there should be a compulsory license for everything on the internet. Well, you see, I took a pause, counted to 10, and then addressed the issue. So the temptation is there to say, oh, this is too hard. And so whatever they consider, the broadcast, the 111, and all the licenses and public performance, they really need to step back and see if you're going to consider this a public performance, and the making available appears to be in that kind of genre, what you're going to do. Are you going to then say, here's a better way to do it? And you can't ask the FCC for guidance as to what's cable or broadcast in that context, because maybe they really don't know right now. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Band? So addressing specifically the, the issue that uh, Maria asked, I think it was Maria who asked it, um, about, about consensus uh, with respect to um, uh, Putting a, a, a work okay. in, a, in, in the in the in the share file, um, you know, I, I think there probably would be a degree of consensus that that is implicated by 106. But what part of 106 there might be disagreement on? So, so uh, the, not not to sound too much like a broken record, you know, I, I would view that as uh, certainly the courts have found that to be a distribution right. You know, that uh, an infringement of the distribution right. I, I think it would probably be better to classify it as a, uh, an infringement of the reproduction right. And, and, and here I just want to respond briefly to what uh, uh, you know, the, the, the question that Professor Minnell asked at the end of the last uh, session when I made the same point, <laughs> uh, which is you know, I, it, it does seem to me that um, it, you know, it's, it's more of a timing issue. In other words, if a, a, a user uh, f first uploads or first installs peer-to-peer uh, -peer software and then after that places a, uh, a work on their hard drive and, and, and by virtue of the peer-to-peer -peer software that, that work sort of by default is automatically in the share file and automatically is made available, it seems to me that that probably would be uh, an infringement of the reproduction right. It could be if the order was reversed, in other words, that the work was on the hard drive first, and then the, the software, the peer-to-peer -peer software was placed, maybe that wouldn't, in that specific case, there wouldn't be uh, uh, an infringement of the reproduction right with respect to the, uh, the music file that was already on the hard drive. But presumably, a person's going to keep on adding more music after they already have the peer-to-peer the -peer software on their computer. And it would seem to me that when you do add more uh, music files after you already have that f the, 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 the file sharing software on your computer that any time you add it in a way that sort of automatically makes it available that that would be uh, or should be seen as an infringement of the reproduction right. And so again, that, it seems to me that that takes care of the problem. I guess we got a number of um, people, so I'm just going to go kind of down here because I didn't know that I didn't um, reference the specific order, but I'll go with Ms. Moy, Professor Manel, uh, Mr. Cooper Schmidt, and then Mr. Glacier. Hi, thank you. So I think um, in the in the last panel, I brought up the issue of cloud computing and the possibility that um, that a, a broader making available right would would cover. Uh, uses of cloud computing that we would have no intention of covering. So I think, you know, I, I don't know whether or not we are in, in consensus with respect to this, but I think that any, any clarification coming out of the Copyright Office would have to consider very carefully what happens in a situation where someone saves a PowerPoint presentation with a copyrighted image on a drive that is accessible to members of a company with, say, 500 employees. 
um, or what happens if somebody backs up their hard drive to uh, to a shared network, or what happens if someone accidentally indexes a, fo a folder that is in their Dropbox that contains copyrighted works um, to make it available publicly uh, through a link on the web, even though they don't share that link. What what happens in each one of these situations? And I think um, I, someone else mentioned on the last panel that I don't think anybody who is in favor of a broader making available right would want to cover these types of instances. But I think that it's very important that we consider those and make sure that if we're going to clarify that some sharing, some placing of copyrighted works in a shared folder um, uh, constitutes distribution under 106, then we need to make sure that it doesn't cover those other uses. Professor Manel. How you accomplish this goal of assisting courts and assisting Congress uh, is, is an interesting question of, of governance. You know, what is the role of the Copyright Office in this, you know, in this complex web of institutions? Uh, here's, I think there's a tiered set of, of approaches, but one approach might be to, through a, an official document that has, uh, I'll use the orphan work study as an example, that, that provides, uh, you know, a very scholarly approach to the issue that tries to sort of look out at all of the work that's been done and to try to organize that so that courts and lawyers can access that. I think that's sort of a low level of intervention. And especially on this area, the reason I entitled my, my article uh, in search of copyright the lost ark, because I think we've lost some of that institutional memory. It's now there, and I think that people are going to reference it increasingly. And so to, to help to, to make that more accessible to the public. Uh, it, it was interesting to me just because two members of the Copyright Office uh, staff, who I have great admiration for, David Carson and Rob Kucinich, both wrote excellent articles about this problem leading up to it, but we've lost connection, the institutional memory, and that's what had happened even by 1976. So to the extent that, you know, you're playing just sort of an archival role, you will help that process. Now, some justices and judges might not consider this pertinent. We've heard a lot about whether or not legislative history is appropriate. I think that we are inevitably uh, drawn to, to getting behind that curtain, that we want to see what people were talking about and how they thought about it. And I think when you do that, often it does achieve clarity. And so, so this is kind of a very low-level intervention that uh, I don't think anyone could really object to. You're just telling the history of how a law came to be in which the Copyright Office was the central actor. And so I don't know that it, it requires you to do that much more than uh, what I and, and Professor Nimmer uh, try to do, but it does matter that it comes from a, a, an institution like this. Uh, there are, I think, steps above that, and we've heard reasons why perhaps those steps ought not to be taken at least aggressively or immediately. Uh, you know, my instinct is to try to, to see how the, the green paper process plays out in conjunction with some of the things that Representative Goodlatte is doing and what you're doing, but building towards what was referred to earlier is, is really trying to set forth the group of studies that would enable the nation to look at this set of questions. But if you're looking for what can be done in the short run, I think just, just providing uh, you know, that history will be a valuable service. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper Schmidt. So you asked what uh, copyright office guidance should look like. I'll go back to my earlier answer, which I don't think the Copyright Office, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to provide any clarification or guidance here. Um, there's a real risk that when you do so, you may create, inadvertently, create a whole new can of worms or level of confusion. Um, but to the extent you decide otherwise, I think actually uh, Mr. Adler had a, had a good example um, or a good suggestion about filing briefs, it, maybe not every case, but in certain more complicated cases or something, which gives the Copyright Office the ability to look at the factual scenario in that case and determine and, you know, ha how it should apply. Um, but if the Copyright Office were to go down this path in terms of defining 
or, or clarifying what it means to, or the making available right, or what it means to make something available, you've got to define what that term means. What does it mean to make something available? What, what types of actions, what are the parameters of doing so, what are the limitations? And that's, uh, like I said, I think that's, uh, I think that's fairly difficult. I want to raise some other issues that people, uh, or address some other issues that people said, uh, Mr. Bridges mentioned, well, in order to do that, you have to define copy as being consistent with 106.3 uh, uh, and 109 have to be consistent, and that's, that's just not the case. I mean, uh, the first sale doctrine 109 talks about the particular copy, so we'll, we'll move on from there and save that, uh, that discussion, the first sale doctrine, for another day. Um, uh, Jonathan, in, addre in addressing the, uh, the, shared, uh, the shared file issue, whether a copy in a shared file, um, reverts back to sort of that it should be a violation of the reproduction right, and, and that's, that's thinking, some somewhat antiquated thinking because of the cloud computing issue where you have something that is legally, legitimately put up in the cloud is not an illegal reproduction, uh, but access to that may be limited to one person or a group of people, but then uh, access is provided to that much greater to, the, to, to the what is supposed to be uh, provided. Uh, and that is exactly the type of scenario where we need the distribution right to cover that type of situation. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, uh, Laura had mentioned that um, the, the situation of somebody who accidentally uh, uploads a work um, onto a shared file, it sort of reminded me of that old Steve Martin bit, you know, oops, I forgot murder was against the law. Um, <laughs> So, um, and, then, and then eventually she says the error was discovered and corrected. I, I mean, we're going to get that, that, that excuse in every single case if that, if that were the situation. Oops, I, I didn't know I did it accidentally. I mean, that, will, that, that issue, the state of mind or the intent, will go to damages. It will not, it, it's, it's, it has not been, should not be a role, uh, play a role in copyright unless you're talking about secondary liability, which we're not in this case. So in terms of be it uh, academic articles or software, something put on a shared file, know what you're doing. Know, know, know who you're letting access to your computer and your files to. I mean, that's good practice aside from copyright. Thank you. And I think I'm going to just go down the, the row um, in terms of order. So uh, Mr. Glazier, then uh, Mr. Bridges, Mr. Barnes, Ms. Astars, and Mr. Adler, and then I'll come back to Ms. Moy. Thank you. I think maybe guidance is the wrong word. <clears throat> because it almost makes it sound like a business advisory opinion or something uh, from the Department of Justice where you're commenting on whether it's okay for somebody to proceed with a particular business plan or whether they are or aren't going to be liable under it. And I think you, you can't do that because you can't make that guarantee of enforcement. And um, I think maybe opinion is the better word, and I do think it's pretty necessary because the Copyright Office has issued an opinion on this in the past during the development of the legislation and beyond that. And now you have a handful of district courts who have issued opinions that do not mesh with the stated public opinion of the expert agency during that time. So I do think it's time for an updated opinion where the Copyright Office specifically addresses why it still believes what it believes, if it does, despite the handful of cases that have, you know, come out and tried to, you know, apply uh, the umbrella approach to the particular facts of those cases. And I do think it's necessary to get into, you know, what the Supreme Court has said, and you have said this in the past, between, you know, uh, uh, has said about the link between distribution and publication, because it can be quite circular. And you, you know, sort of brought this up where, you know, we certainly believe that uh, uh, distribution in 106.3 uh, broadly includes general publication, uh, and that general public and that publication is defined, and distribution is not. And I know they covered this this morning, but publication really does explicitly cover offering to distribute, but requires some distribution. So it, you know, the whole thing is circular. You've addressed this before. You've talked about why making available exists uh, in the umbrella approach. And I think it's necessary to just, uh, I won't even use the word clarify, to update the opinion to specifically note why that approach is still the opinion of the expert agency today, despite a few district court opinions that um, you know, seem to, when applied to particular facts, go in a different direction. 
Thank you, Mr. Uh, Bridges and Mr. Barnes, Mr. Barnes, and then Ms. Astars and Mr. Adler. Sure. Well, I, I sort of like the concept of investigation that both Ms. Lyons and Professor Manel suggested. But the question is, what should we be investigating? I've heard earlier today statements that, well, maybe the Copyright Act is obsolete, or maybe it hasn't kept up with the times, or maybe the changes in technology are putting undue pressure on things, and we need to understand how to address uh, new challenges like BitTorrent and the like. I think the way to do that uh, is not to do historical research in how we got from the 1909 Act to this obsolete 1976 Act. I think that uh, if we're going to investigate things, let's investigate requiring fact, evidence-based criteria what in this state promotes the progress of science and the useful arts. Isn't that the enterprise? Let's understand how this discussion fits into, into the copyright's constitutional purpose. Let's look for evidence-based discussions, not sort of uh, necessarily partisan predictions of how people will themselves react if certain things happen and don't happen, but do a broader uh, uh, fact-based investigation uh, of that nature. And then there can be some guidance about whether the current conditions measured by that standard justify congressional action or not, and then whether uh, the conditions justify some other response. But it seems to me, I, I agree, an investigation is appropriate, but I think, I think uh, the unique uh, uh, virtue and competence of the Copyright Office is to measure these questions according to the constitutional purpose of copyright and to make evidence-based decisions. Thank you very much, Mr. Barnes. I think um, we should probably stay away from some of the titles just in general. So when we call it clarification, guidance, or opinions, I think automatically you're gonna get certain stakeholders that are concerned um, because they're gonna, you're gonna position them as winners or losers uh, automatically. I, th I, I think uh, Professor Manel's framework is really valid. Um, looking at historical background um, as a starting point. And the reason I think that's important is because uh, members of Congress, there's a lot of turnover on Judiciary Committee and within Congress at large. And so, and, and Andrew's a good friend and, and I often agree with him, but it's important to educate the members because a lot of them don't have the historical background that framework to understand how we got to where we are today. And I think that would be helpful. And, and this is a very technical area of law, most people know. So I think that is a good starting point. I think what I would add to this report, which is what I would just call it on this topic of making available, um, is uh, an issue spotting area. So we've talked about, I think there was a back and forth between Andrew and Keith just about the definition of copy. And, and so we should look at certain things that would have to be decided if Congress was gonna change the law, um, and that can be flagged for members so that they can look at that. Um, but I would stay away from actually making strong recommendations. I mean, you obviously could include in this report uh, a back and forth about where certain stakeholders are. Uh, so at least that way, members of Congress kind of get a sense of where the constituencies are at large. But I don't know, but I would stop short of doing the actual hard recommendation. And, and I think there's a couple reasons you want to do that. It's, and it's, it's simply because technology changes, business models adapt and evolve, and where you draw the line in this report um, is not going, is going to be debated for years to come through litigation, and it's probably not going to suffice um, five years from now. And so maybe it's better to just stop at that point in the report and then have members of Congress take it up from there. Thank you, Ms. Hastars. Thanks. Um, I guess I would start by asking the question, who's your audience when you're issuing guidance? And um, my answer to that would be that the courts are your audience, uh, the courts, the clerks, and the judges uh, writing the opinions. And so in issuing guidance, I guess I would begin by considering the umbrella approach, um, commenting on why it still uh, applies, why it still works, 
um, perhaps uh, reviewing the scope of rights uh, under each of the implied rights, the evidentiary requirements uh, for each, uh, and commenting on the existing case law and providing some rationale for um, understanding that case law uh, under the rubric that you've uh, provided for the, for the courts uh, to consider. Um, and uh, maybe conclude with a, explaining how to, uh, in general terms, uh, continue to uh, rule in a fashion that um, upholds our obligations internationally and that remains consistent with congressional intent generally. Um, what I would not suggest is taking a very granular approach and you know, trying to imagine all of the different scenarios that might come up and commenting on, well, this is in and this is out. And if you, you know, place a file uh, in your share folder, um, you know, before you've installed software versus after, no, it, you know, no, no uh, disrespect intended to uh, Jonathan, but um, I just think that's a very difficult exercise to engage in, um, you know, regardless how you, you come out on the result, you're just never going to be able to imagine all the, all the possible scenarios um, and factual uh, situations. Um, the other comment that I would make is um, with regard to the cloud computing concerns that have been raised, and um, I, I share uh, some of the views that uh, Keith Kofferschmidt expressed. Um, I, I guess I would say I'm, it's not clear to me why this situation is any different um, than any other business situation that businesses find themselves in with regards to, you know, employees, um, uh, you know, behaving appropriately in the workplace. Um, you know, it, it's no different to me than making sure that they're not making you know, hundreds of copies of an article and distributing them in analog form. Um, it's just a different iteration of the same problem and businesses have dealt with that over the years, um, you know, quite readily, either by getting CCC licenses or by issuing best practices and educating their, uh, educating their employees as to what's appropriate and what's not. So I, I, I don't see it as any different of a problem. Th thank you very much. Before I move on to Mr. Adler, I'll just point out that we have about 15 minutes left in this session. So I think I'm going to go back around to all of the people who have their flags up now um, for final remarks, and then we'll open it up and see if there's any audience uh, comments. Uh, Mr. Adler. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make two points. One sort of builds on the, the point I made before and then is amplified by what, what Mitch suggested and, and, and what Sandra had suggested. Um, the legislative history that Professor Minnell unearthed is, is, is very interesting. It's also uh, very revealing about the, the evolution of these concepts in the, the Copyright Act. But ultimately, I think uh, we, we find ourselves in the position that we're in because the people who espouse the umbrella approach uh, basically uh, failed us in the sense that their approach uh, ignored basic rules of, of statutory construction and also uh, made a, a very essential etymological mistake. They, they simply seem to have assumed that uh, the making available uh, right uh, and the terminology used was basically redundant with the idea of distribution. Uh, of course, we now know it's not. There's an overlap, to be sure, uh, as there is an overlap with public performance and display. Uh, but clearly, Generally speaking, uh, when a legislature uses different words, one doesn't assume that they're merely asserting the same idea and using different words to do it. Um, the, the idea that uh, the WIPO treaties established making available as a new right, uh, but merely that it was redundant of the existing right of distribution, makes no sense in the international context, and it makes even less sense with respect to the way in which the U.S. would uh, treat the question of whether or not that right already existed in U.S. law. And, and I see the error here as one that, that uh, very recently occurred uh, by the Supreme Court in the Kurtzang case and was pointed out, interestingly, by one-third of the majority in that decision, indicating that really, uh, as far as the makeup of the court was concerned, that majority opinion was wrong. Uh, Justice Kagan, uh, with Justice Alito in uh, agreement, pointed out that they were stuck 
uh, with the Supreme Court's Quality King decision in which the court simply assumed that importation is a form of distribution, nothing more. And because distribution is subject to the first sale doctrine as a limitation, so must importation right in the same way. Um, but as she pointed out, if they had recognized that importation differs from distribution in key ways, and certainly would differ with respect to the way it might interplay with the first sale doctrine, if there's an interplay at all, uh, you would have come out with a very different result that actually would have made very sensible law and sensible policy. And I think the same thing is true here. Uh, and the, this is, again, uh, the burden, I think, initially of the United States government in terms of taking positions uh, as to what its uh, advocacy of the umbrella approach uh, to codification or the, the lack of need of codification of a making available right means to be able to articulate to the courts uh, how making available differs from and is not merely redundant of distribution or publication for that matter. And I think if that were done, it would open the door uh, to being able to make the appropriate distinctions between the way making available uh, you know, uh, interacts with distribution, the way it interacts with uh, public performance, the way it interacts with display. If you were to pick any 20 people off the street and ask them if they knew what it meant to make something available, they probably would give you a very reasonable and fairly consistent answer to that question. Uh, we're, we've kind of tortured this because it's a legal concept and it has far-reaching applications when applied uh, by the courts. And then the other point I was going to make goes back to, again, my friend Jonathan's uh, dogged insistence that the reproduction right uh, resolves all of these issues. Um, again, it loses sight, and I think Jacqueline, your question this morning pointed that out. It loses sight of the fact that when um, we began looking at the question of how uh, existing copyright law would work or wouldn't work in the digital era, uh, remember the quaintly named information superhighway studies that were done in 1995 by, uh, and led by uh, Vice President Gore after he discovered the internet. Um, basically, when, when they were doing that, the thing that they understood more than anything else as the central concept that made their uh, need to study those questions so important was the realization that the same acts violating the same rights that had existed in the analog world but now occurring in the digital environment would have exponentially greater harm. And so there was a need to consider their application in different contexts, but also in different terms. And so, for example, when, when Jonathan says that this all could be uh, treated very simply if we just focused on the fact that reproduction is involved, so let's forget about making available, let's even forget about distribution and just call it a violation of, of the reproduction right. So essentially, everything gets reduced to the making of a single copy, and that's the scope of the violation, regardless of the exponential level of harm that could result when that happens online. And it seems to me that we've talked a great deal about this in terms of its relation to statutory damages. But remember, there's another whole area of remedies to consider here, and that's the area of injunctive relief. And because injunctive relief is an equitable doctrine, uh, it's perfectly legitimate for judges in those cases to be able to consider that when somebody places a copy of a copyrighted work into a shared folder online, are they doing so in reckless disregard of a reasonably foreseeable harm that's likely to occur? That's something that is perfectly within the right of a federal judge to consider in shaping injunctive relief. And I think we need to think more about that aspect of this issue when we think about the importance of why making available was established as a separate right and not merely something that was repetitive or redundant of existing rights. Thank you very much. And I think we have, a, oh, I guess we have a few more flags. Um, as I said, we're going to try to see if we have a few moments um, for um, uh, audience participation, but I think I had said uh, Ms. Moy next, and then I will go back um, and start with uh, Ms. Wolf, Professor Manel, Ms. Lyons, and then uh, end with uh, Mr. Band. So I'm just um, I'm just trying to to bring us back to thinking about the situations where perhaps no distribution has actually occurred, and we're just looking at offering something to the public. Um, and as public knowledge explained in our comments, we don't think that 
we don't think that there should be an exclusive right to cover that situation. But that aside, if we're going to decide to cover that, I do think that we need to take into consideration the average user. And other members of this panel have said that they don't think that uh, and the average user would accidentally index um, something that is a copyrighted work uh, on a shared drive or um, that they should just have company best pra practices or just best practices generally to prevent, uh, to pre prevent copyrighted works from ending up on shared drives. But I think I it's <laughs> the situation where someone, for example, puts together a PowerPoint presentation that includes a copyrighted image and saves it on a networked drive is something that is going to occur all the time. It occurs all the time now. And I think that, you know, if, if we think that that, I think if you think that that doesn't occur, then you're out of touch with the average user. You're, uh, you're greatly overestimating the sophistication of the average user. <coughs> and if we think that every one of those instances is a, is a copyright violation, I think that that's at odds with copyrights, uh, copyright's intent to uh, promote the progress of science and the useful arts, and it's also at odds with the treaty. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Wolf. Well, I'll give you a very easy broad license for that image and you'll have no problem. <laughs> you can do that within your company. I mean, to me, that's, that's just licensing. And you take care of it when you start and you think about your uses. Um, but I just wanted to sort of go back to the original question is, you know, do we think the umbrella approach um, still works today? And I think it only does if the courts correctly understand and interpret the, the ex six exclusive rights that we have. And I think in some areas we do fail. And I you know, go back to the display right, I think we do fail there. And how we try to give either guidance, opinion, um, or, or wait for the courts. And I think we have to remember that you know, the Constitution does talk about authors. And authors can be a general user and they can be individual artists, they can be visual artists, they can be songwriters. And they can't always afford to go to the Supreme Court and wait to make law change. And I think if there's any way to have clarity or, or uh, have any type of, um, whether you, whatever you call it, opinions, to make it clear that we have each of these six exclusive rights and that they're separate and you, you can violate a, the public right to display without having a reproduction. I mean, all those things I think would be very helpful because judges are generalists and they don't always get things right and they only look at the papers they do have in front of them. So if, the, if it means having you know, the government pr present briefs like they did in the recent Alaska Stock versus Munch case, no, Alaska Stock versus HMH, uh, it's just helpful for going back to um, copyright office practices and what um, what people expect their rights are. I mean, people, you know, visual artists do expect that they do have a right to public display the work and to control those rights. Thank you very much, Professor Manel. The copyright office has historically played some essential roles in in our entire cultural history. So, I, I look at this question and I say, well. There isn't one hat. There are multiple hats that you need to be focused on. And one is, is fidelity to law, that, that the Copyright Office is part of the, the knowledge that guides courts and the public. And, and so I, I believe that being you know, much more open about how judges can access the law very hard for lawyers to make some of the arguments that I as a scholar can make. Part of the reason I file briefs in the courts is because the courts are going to be suspicious when something gets pulled out of legislative history. Uh, I try to be very thorough in the work that I do. I never want someone to say, you missed something. And I think the Copyright Office is a place that can do that with you know, a high degree of fidelity. Uh, it has those records. It, it can and should maintain that institutional memory. And I'll point out something that no one has picked up on, but it was in this research I found, the Geneva Phonogram Convention. It was a very interesting part of the history that led to specific language in the Sound Recording Amendments Act of 1971 having to do with making available. And so I don't go to the, you know, to the more recent treaties. I go all the way back there, and the U.S. took a, a pretty aggressive position in order to establish uh, you know, serious protection for uh, phonograms. And, and so that's part of our history, and I think it does inform these issues, and some of the language that wound up in the 76 Act grew out of that whole little sideshow, but it's a really interesting sideshow. So that's one hat. The other hat is as a legislative counselor. 
and the entire 76 Act grew out of the Copyright Office as really the, the drafter, the drafting institution doing events like this. Uh, and I, I think that that ought to be sketched out. And I realize you have principles that you respond to in Congress, uh, but I, I think that they could perhaps benefit from hearing sort of more systematic approach to how we're going to get at perhaps the evidence-based decision making that, that Andrew referred to. But I will say as someone who was involved in a recent NAS study about evidence-based decision making, I'm skeptical even as a social scientist that we're going to get the answers to all the questions that we want through, through you know, empirical studies. The data is very hard to get at and the data can't deal with a whole bunch of hypothetical scenarios. The problem when I look out into the content world today is that I worry increasingly about how advertising is now the dominant modality for paying for our culture. And Madison Avenue shouldn't be the way in which art comes about. It should come about through markets, markets with the, the consumers, which people who value those works. And so it's not hard to put together an empirical study showing, look, these industries are doing better than they used to do. But when artists are being told you need to have these product placements or we need to do this and that, that I think corrupts the entire system. So I, I do think empirical evidence is going to be very important, but I, I think it's really important not to just accept st traditional measures. We have to go back to what copyright was about, which was creating a marketplace for the creativity that would come up through a, a true marketplace and not this, this I think, uh, much – uh, limited marketplace that is driven by, you know, media. Thank you very much. I think we have three people remaining, but only a few minutes. So if I could ask everyone to just be very brief. Yes, please. Miss Lyons. Uh, just a wrap-up thought. Uh, since 76, uh, the act was uh, adopted, there have been important developments in the computational capabilities and networking. And I think we'll all recognize that that's the case. And oftentimes, people talk about a copyright work as if it's a music work rather than the representation of that work in some digital form. And we've been working with the copyright industries for many years now to develop uh, ways of structuring the data so that it would be uh, identifiable and manage, you can manage the licensing rights in the network environment. Um, and in this context, we've been, I've been giving some consideration to uh, if copy is found to just be the tangible, which I suspect may be where it comes out, that there might be alternate bases for uh, exploring if you have um, a digital object or other similar data structure that's uniquely and persistently identifiable, and there's some way in the registry system to keep hash of that, that it could be a logical equivalent of a copy. And this comes into play particularly when you're in a volatile processing environment, because if it's you're playing a video game that has pre-existing works that are incorporated in that, there may be new works that are generated on the fly, just as it's happening. So you might want to consider that. And in conjunction with that, um, how to identify that it's protected. So the notice of copyright really, truly needs to be reevaluated in its current form it doesn't perform that useful function at all. And some sort of agreed standard in the metadata, which would be acceptable under the Berne Convention, they have a provision that would allow standardization of certain identification information, may be a helpful start than that. Now, for evaluation, just a quick practical suggestion. Very quickly, because I'm going to have to I'm going to do it. Uh, you have use cases. I mean, I've been to many standards groups, and they have use cases. Well, instead of taking a, a live litigation where people are at each other, if you take a use case, the scenario of things that are going on out there in the real internet environment, and invite comment on the different aspects, and start developing a record of where people find things don't quite fit properly, that's one way you might think about. Thank you very much. And then I think in the last two minutes, we'll have the final comments from the participants, Mr. Glazier and then Mr. Band. Uh, one, one thing Laura said I thought was pretty concerning, and that was that somehow the distribution right right now only covers when there is an actual transfer of a copy. And if you're offering for distribution, somehow that is not covered and that making available would be a stretch and 
uh, we would have to, you know, we would be expanding rights if we covered something in a search fo folder or how people use the internet today. For enforcement purposes, if you had to have a snapshot picture of an actual transfer of a copy in order to enforce your rights, you would have no remedy at all. And so the idea that putting something into a place on a computer network that is accessible to members of the public, as it states in Section 506, and offering it for distribution under the definition of publication, which is at least equated, if not, you know, encompassed within distribution, to say that that is not covered by the current distribution right, um, I think is a big stretch. I would hate for that to be implied. The constitutional mandate is to protect the exclusive, we always forget that word, the exclusive rights of authors, which as a consequence promotes science uh, and the useful arts. And so I, I don't think people should get confused about offering for distribution. It is definitely part of the copyright law and it is not a stretch or an amendment to make it so. Thank you, we'll conclude the panelists with Mr. Band. So, so I might not agree with all of Mitch's interpretations, but putting that aside, uh, j just very quickly, you know, the, the, the Washington Post yesterday had a, this big story about all these reports that are issued that no one reads. And it, and it Don't say said, that about the copyright <laughs> office, please. And, 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 and it drew, the, in my view, the wrong conclusion. It said, well, these are all you know, useless and no one reads them. But I think the problem is not that they're not read, but that they are read, but that they're read and they're misused or taken out of context many years later. And I think that that's something that we really need to, or not me, you, need to think about when you consider you know, uh, doing a, a study report analysis, whatever in this area, is, is uh, you know, how is it likely to be used not only in the next five years, but how is it likely to be used in 25 years? And you know, I'm just thinking about you know, the, the, uh, the report that the Copyright Office came, I think it came out with in 1983 about interpreting 108, and I think that it was interpretation was completely wrong, but putting that aside, I mean that, that report, you know, 25-year-old or whatever, how many every year is that is, 30-year-old report uh, is, is a, an issue in ongoing litigation, uh, you know, in a completely different factual context. And so I think that there is a danger to having these reports that then many, many years later, you know, again, when the, the world changes, uh, but still someone's going to say, oh, look at what the Copyright Office said, the expert agency said then. Uh, so I think that that's uh, 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 a danger that you need to be aware of, especially, you know, in this context, why a report here as opposed to any one of the other 20 issues that you could easily be doing reports on. Uh, and, and, then the, and then the final remark, just getting back to where we started, is that, um, you know, it's true that it's always important to know, you know, how we got to where we are and, and the, 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 the roots uh, and the, the legislative history and all the back and forth, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, a judge has to decide, you know, it's up to the judge to make the decision, you know, how to apply uh, the law to the facts, um, and, you know, sort of all the, the, the legislative history is interesting, but at the end of the day, it's their job, and I think we need to trust them uh, and understand that in, you know, we can't sort of micromanage what courts are gonna do uh, what through reports, interpretations, legislation, you know, whatever, judges are going to have to uh, apply uh, uh, the law to facts and, you know, the facts are always going to be changing, the technology is always going to be evolving, and so we have to at least at some level have trust in that they're going to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists. I'm going to open it up and see if there is anybody from the audience. Professor Ginsburg. I don't want to weigh in on the institutional competence question. Uh, I just... Uh, want to uh, react to uh, particularly Ms. Moy's um, comments because I think they take the making available right or whatever <laughs> we have um, out, of, uh, out of context to the extent that uh, there's, we still have the fair use doctrine, we still have section 512, and I thought um, that a number of Ms. Moy's examples were actually very good illustrations of how um, a making available right, digital distribution, whatever you want to call it, um, can uh, uh, 
play together <laughs> with the, the, uh, the fair use doctrine. So the example of lots of scientists, let's say, are working together um, in a peer-to-peer -peer network or um, they're all uploading and downloading their files to a shared drop Dropbox folder. Well, that might be a terrific example of fair use. That might, it, it may be that any third party copyrighted content is um, being made available to too large a number of people to constitute a non-public, but if it's non-commercial um, research, that's probably fair use. Uh, and if it's commercial research, this is Texaco. So how is it different whether um, the uh, the content is being distributed by photocopies to the R&D department of a for-profit uh, enterprise, or that same content is being made available through uh, a, a shared uh, storage locker in, in the cloud. So I, I still think that uh, reg regardless, uh, the fair, fair use doctrine is very much part of it. And on uh, the, the power, the photo in the PowerPoint uh, example, in addition to, to Nancy's response, if you're showing that PowerPoint to uh, a large number of persons such that uh, it's a public performance and in Section 1101 doesn't apply, well, that's already uh, a violation of the of the public performance right. So I'm, I'm not sure that at least that that uh, every scenario uh, which might look problematic if we said, oh my goodness, that's a making available to the public and it's a, it's a new violation, whether, uh, whether or not uh, it is a prima facie violation is not necessarily an infringement because of the fair use doctrine and other exceptions. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the panelists. Um, we're going to quickly set up for session four, which will be um, a discussion of foreign implementation interpretation of the WIPO Internet Treaties. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.